okay? Okay, we are live. Hello, everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of uh, Ready with an Answer. And, and uh, the, uh, the question today is about Calvinism. And we're, we're, I, I'm very happy that we've got uh, some people on the panel today. I, I consider this to be a, a real powerhouse uh, of uh, panelists because uh, I, every, I respect everybody on this panel as far as their, their knowledge of the word and their, also their, their knowledge of Calvinism and, and why Calvinism is such a, uh, a sickening, uh, repulsive philosophy. I think we can all agree that we, we loathe, we abhor, we detest, we despise the philosophy of Calvinism. I think that is true with everybody on the panel. So I think we'll be passionate and everybody's full of knowledge. I'm going to have everybody just say hello to the listening audience right now, one at a time. And even though Brother Jack Smack is not, you don't see him on an icon here because his computer is not functioning right, we're able to have him participate just with the old-fashioned telephone. So I've got him on the line here. Brother Jack, would you say hi to everybody? Just make a brief statement about your channel, what you're going to do with your YouTube channel. Well, my, my channel is purposed for the... Um, <coughs> the sake of evangelism, getting people the clear gospel, you know, the simple gospel, and to eradicate uh, all these false gospels out there. And I'm also trying to encourage people, you know, to be avid soul winners. So that's pretty much it. Yes. Okay, so it's, it's Jack Smack 7-7, seven, seven, or the three sevens or two sevens? It's two sevens. Okay, Jack Smack 7-7. Seven, seven. If you have not yet subscribed, please subscribe to Brother Jack Smack's channel. Uh, he is uh, truly one of the great... Uh, warriors for the, the free grace, um, true message of salvation. Okay, we'll start on the far left side of this screen here. I have uh, Brother Austin. Uh, Austin, will you say hi to the audience and uh, tell everybody just a, a moment about your channel, what you're trying to do? Sure, thank you, Brother Luke. Uh, my name is Austin Bell. My channel's name is Austin Bell. I'm uh, really glad to be back. Uh, I wanted to jump in on this Grace Powerhouse, uh, get this truth out about Calvinism. And uh, on my channel, I just like to keep the gospel um, pure and simple and sweet to heart and how it should be. Okay, amen. Uh, I'll tell you that uh, uh, Brother Austin uh, has been on these panels uh, many times in the past. And uh, I, I think that he was basically uh, uh, holding back in the past and just listening and, and, and trying to learn from everybody on the panel. But uh, a few months ago, he decided to start making his own videos, and he's, he's prolific. I mean, he's just making video after video, and, and every video is tell, it's really saying the same thing but in a different way. And he is proclaiming this, uh, that salvation is a free gift that no works are required. So I, I just want to commend him, and, and I hope everybody will subscribe to uh, Brother Austin's channel. His channel is Austin Bell. Okay, next we have uh, Brother Bill Cuthbert uh, from England. And Bro Bill, will you want to say hi to everybody? Yep. Yeah, hello, hello, everyone. Um, basically, uh, my channel is pretty similar to, to Brother Austin's, and I just try and get the gospel out you know, without perversion and as simple as possible, you know, because, our, our, you know, the world is is actually dying, you know, without, you know and, and they're, they're, it's being pervaded by so many false gospels and so many, you know, pseudo-religions that it, it's actually rare, you know, it took me nearly 20 years to get the true gospel and, you know, I've made it a mission to make sure, you know, everyone, you know, I can communicate with what I'm going to try and communicate with. Basically, that's it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brother Bill. Uh, he has a, a channel called uh, Bill Cuthbert, but he also has a channel called The Panda Man Evangelist. So please subscribe to his channel. And I would say that, you know, I've been a street preacher for many years. I, I've preached over a thousand times on the streets. And I, I want to say that uh, Brother Jack Smack and Brother Bill Cuthbert are just about the only two street preachers, street evangelists that I've ever seen that are really preaching the free grace message. And it's it's shameful that most street preachers are really 
teaching a, a heretical works salvation system. So I, I just want to commend both of you for what you're doing with your evangelism. Okay, next we have Brother uh, uh, Jackson. And uh, go ahead and say hi, Jackson. Hi, Jackson. <laughs> and I wasn't just saying that to be smart, Alecky. Uh, my brain is a little bit different because I'm autistic. I have Asperger's syndrome. And I sometimes will st just perceive things a little bit differently than other people. So I'm trying to... Uh, I'm trying to stand up for the free grace message of salvation because it seems to me like people are taking a lot of Bible verses and Ill in an illogical way. And like, like in my inner varsity group at CSU, I just came across this girl who was preaching and it just sounded totally like a false work salvation thing. But then when I confronted her, she believed the same thing as I did. And she was like, oh, I didn't mean to say that you had to stop sinning to be saved and whatnot. And so she was like, oh, you should teach us how to be, make it clear and everything. So I, I guess I'm, I'm sort of becoming more and more of kind of a security guard. Although my channel is more just my analytical thoughts, if that makes sense. Yes. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you talked about that experience, and I, I hope, well, let's all pray for Brother, Brother Jackson's, his, uh, his ministry at CSU. Uh, colleges are full of liberalism and, and false gospels, and, and uh, so, yeah, he's, he's going to be there to help people to, it is interesting how some people, they actually believe in free grace, but they're using the wrong words, you know, they're using things like, Ask be Jesus into your heart and, and or give your life to Christ or give something. Your life to Christ and and, and they, they understand that it's free gift, but they're just kind of they hear things and they repeat them. So, yeah, what what Jackson's going to be doing there is uh, is very very important. Okay, let's move on now to Brother Wayne Crook and and Elaine Crook, his wife. Um, uh, Wayne's. Um, audio is not working, so he'll be participating today by posting uh, text comments that we will uh, be reading and, and uh, replying to. But Brother Wayne and his wife, uh, Sister Elaine, are, uh, they are just prolific, uh, working every single day, uh, posting uh, videos and comments uh, that are uh, they're just very, very helpful to me. I watch almost everything they put up and recommend I watch, and I, I hope everybody else will uh, follow what they're doing, and uh, you know, I, I think what you're doing is very, very important and valuable. So, uh, All right, uh, Brother Wayne, nod your head if you're ready to go. Okay, everybody's ready. Okay, we got the preliminaries, the introductions out of the way, so now let me say, uh, if you watched my Hangouts in the past uh, audience, uh, you know that uh, I've been you know, uh, participating and commenting a lot in the discussion. Today, I hope I don't have to say a whole lot because I made a sixth video series a few weeks ago about Calvinism, and uh, I'm using the same outline today to ask the panel to respond. And so since I've already made my my comments about, about this, uh, I, I just want to basically interview the panelists. I'm going to ask each one of the panelists to respond to these notes that I have. And uh, it'll probably take us uh, several episodes. The episodes are two hours long, and I think it's going to probably take us three, four, five episodes to get through this entire program. So um, audience, I hope you find it interesting and continue watching all the way through. So I'm going to start off right now with the beginning of my notes. And the question is, uh, why even address Calvinism? Why is it, is it important or not? Should we even be talking about Calvinism? For years, I kind of ignored it. I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want the controversy or anything. But, but my question to the, uh, to the panelists right now, and um, I think we'll just go through from left to right, starting with Austin, and work our way through. Um, uh, just tell us briefly, since we have so many people on the panel, to keep it fairly brief. But tell us, Austin, uh, why do you think this is even important to discuss Calvinism? Uh, well, just uh, if I may start for say so real quick, uh, I highly disagree with Calvinism on all three points. Uh, also, hyper Calvinism, and also um, just its uh, side factor Arminianism. I believe they're evil and contrived, and that they take away from the beauty and the the rest of the the true gospel of Jesus Christ. 
I believe it's absolutely necessary to expose these heretical doctrines and then um, get them cleared up with uh, the true light and the true grace of Jesus Christ. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. And next, uh, Brother Bill, uh, if you think it's well, I guess you think it's important because you're here talking about it. So why? Why is it important to discuss this? For me, it's important because you know you do. We've spoken, you know, privily about this. That I used to be a Calvinist, a five pointer, and you know, through you know more study of God's word, you know, and God obviously, you know, the Holy Ghost revealing things to me. You know, I got to the point where where I utterly rejected it. It's, it's blasphemous as much as it promotes the blood of Christ. You know, it, it's it's saying that his blood is was not sufficient enough to save all mankind, which it clearly is. You know, and, and you know, a verse that has, has been close to my heart is one Timothy four ten. Is it okay if I read it? Yes, please. Yeah. It says, For therefore we both labour and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God, who is the saviour of all men, especially of those that believe. You know, that's as clear as day that, that, that God, you know, Christ's atonement was all sufficient for all mankind, yet it only avails, you know, for those who, who accept, you know, Christ, you know, who believe upon Christ. So that, that clearly contradicts, you know, uh, Calvinism, you know, amongst plenty of other verses. That one to me was the eye opener. And that took me off the path which I believe, you know, I was in, I was in grave error. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's why I go against Calvinism. All right, thank you. So the uh, the 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 uh, the fact that Jesus died for everybody's sins, whereas Calvinism says no, he only died for select people's sins, and and this is what really is the, one of the main concerns to you, then I guess. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now, brother brother Jackson. Uh, why why is it important to talk about Calvinism? The main reason I would say it's important is because of how widespread it's become and everything. You know, if this were like one cult in the in the hills of Kentucky or something like that, that would be one thing. But this is everywhere. This is just spreading like like some kind of disease or something. And uh, when you think about it, really, it's really a sick sick system because you have to say every child that's aborted every child that's molested is all God's doing which is what which is what consistent five pointers tend to believe in everything and that's a huge attack on the character of God so therefore I feel obligated to stand against this mm -hmm. amen amen so uh, brother Bill has pointed out that the uh, uh, the Jesus's blood was not sufficient for the whole world is is what makes him upset about Calvinism and brother Jackson said that it's the character the uh, the what Calvinism does attacking the character of God he's making God evil because they think God is the author of all all sin so yeah, it, it justifies sort of the the I, I don't know if anyone on this panel has heard of the fictional book series called his dark materials um, it's 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 kind of like an atheist alternative to Narnia, so to speak, and it has God as just sort of this evil being. But what's kind of interesting about it is obviously it it, it, it John Calvin beca became the Pope in this book, and it's kind of alternately written and whatnot. But it but basically the God of this fantasy story is sort of like the God of Calvinism, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And Brother Wayne uh, posted a comment that says it makes God the author of evil. Now we're going to go. We're going to discuss that point and all these points in great detail as we go along. But for right now, uh, the, these are some of the main things that make us upset and, and uh, angry and, and, and uh, sick over Calvinism. And uh, next we got Brother Jack Smack. Well, can you hear me? Yes. Well, the bottom line is that the gospel, the gospel is good news. Luke two ten says that you know it's glad it's good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Now, if Calvinism were true, it would not, would not be to all people; it'd be to the elect. So, the, the gospel, according to that system, would be good news to some, but bad news to, for the rest of the world. Now, the gospel's either good news or it's not, and I'm here to say that it's good news. So, Calvinism just makes the Bible into a big lie. 
and, and everything you guys have said, you know, I, I agree with that, you know, 100. percent And all it does is just make God into a liar. It makes God into a respecter of persons, and it makes soul winning meaningless. Because you don't know if Jesus, in fact, died for certain people, so why tell them? So it just renders everything that the Bible teaches into a big, big mendacity. That's pretty much all I have on that yeah. at this point. <laughs> okay, brother. Yeah. So I, 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 you're a, you're a soul winner. Uh, I think everybody on the panel is a soul winner in their own way, uh, but uh, Brother Jack Smack is, uh, you know, he's he's really diligent at soul winning, and you know, in Calvinism, why should we tell anybody about the the, the gospel? In fact, in fact, that not only soul winning, why should we even pray? Everything is determined by God. There's nothing we do. We don't have anything to say about it, according to Calvinism. So you just said uh, it just really tells us. Um, hey, why don't we just like uh, cr sit and cross our arms and do nothing because uh, uh, it's it's all meaningless. So, yeah, and, uh, and, if, and if any Calvinist out there thinks this video is blasphemy, just remember God is forcing us to do this. Yeah, yeah, amen. That's very true. Let me get my special effects up here so we can even, uh, let me see, where is it? Uh, there's supposed to be something I can do for, oh, there it is, Google Effects. I'm going to. Uh, Jackson is is such a funny guy that we we want to make sure that uh, when he when he puts a smile on our face, we want to make sure that he's recognized for that. So let's do this one here. Uh, where is it? Uh, the la Oh, there it is. Okay, what's that? Laughter. Uh, Rick, our car is not Please Google. Your computer browser don't support. Oh man, we used to be able to do this. I guess I can't do these special effects anymore. So okay, that's all right. We'll we'll get that fixed later. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, these are the reasons that uh, we think that uh, this is important. That we must speak about it. Um, uh, one of the things that I would add too that we we didn't uh, we I think somebody mentioned it briefly, but someone mentioned atheists. I think Calvinism is the is the greatest uh, defense of atheism because atheists can rightly say that um, well if, you know if the God of Calvinism uh, I, I can't believe in that because he's evil he's the one that is is making everybody sin he's in control he forces people to sin and then he burns them in hell forever uh, even though he's the one that made them do it. How could I believe in a God like that? So that's what an, an atheist is, and I think you're justified in saying that. I mean, I wouldn't want to, I couldn't embrace a God that, that is uh, forcing people to sin and then punishing them for it. <laughs> okay, so now we'll go on to the next question is, um, um, uh, oh, free will. Let's talk about free will. You know, we've got uh, we've got uh, the five points of Calvinism that we're going to discuss on t the T U L I P, the acronym. Uh, we're going to go into that in great detail later. But there's something that's really not one of the five points. Uh, I, was, I saw a video where they called it the sixth point of Calvinism. But to me, it is by far the worst aspect of Calvinism, and it's not even part of Tulip. And that is the fact that uh, the, the, how Calvinists see the sovereignty of God, and uh, and versus uh, you know and, and that man has no free will. So I'm going to ask J Brother Jack Smack to begin this part of the discussion. Uh, could you tell us you know how you know according to how Calvinists see sovereignty and how you see sovereignty, and, and uh, how Calvinists believe that uh, man has no free will. Well. I like to preface by saying that if they don't, if a person can read the Bible and come across texts like John 5 uh, 40, where it says, And ye will not come to me that you might have life. <clears throat> and then again, we see this in John 7. It says, If any man will to do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Oh, we have all these verses to talk about, you know, with the will. You know, Revelation 22 17. If a person can read the Bible and not see it, they're blind. They're spiritually blind. And I believe God does give us a free will to make a choice. Otherwise, we're all just a bunch of, you know, automatons. I mean, we're robots. And, and that's, I mean, there's just, the bottom line is that if we see verses that talk about free will all throughout the whole Bible, 
Leviticus chapter 1, we see it in the book of Acts. I believe it's in Acts chapter 14. There's just many verses that talk about, you know, people having a choice, and it's whosoever will. I mean, if you, if you don't choose to have life, then you won't have life. It's that simple. Okay, let me follow up with this for you here. Um, uh, we know that uh, free will is clearly expressed throughout the scriptures. There's no excuse for anybody thinking man does not have free will. Um, but the question of sovereignty. Uh, 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 first of all, uh, I learned from watching uh, a video recently that uh, so the word sovereign or sovereignty does not even appear one time in the KJV Bible. So it, it, the word sovereign's not there, and yet they base all this theology on this idea of sovereignty. But they, they claim that sovereignty means that God uh, doesn't simply have the power to, to do what he wants, but he actually exercises it all the time in every way. That Brother Jack Smack, every thought that you have, every word you speak, Every act you perform, God is making you do it as though you are a puppet or a robot. That's how they define the sovereignty of God. Now, would you respond to that, Brother Jack Smack? Well, the bottom line is that God is, allows us to do what we want, and he is not controlling everybody. It says it, you know, in Acts 14, 16, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Suffered means allowed. He's allowing people to do what they want. He's not controlling um, anybody. And the word sovereign is not in the KJV, correct? So I, I don't have anything to say more than that. Because if it's not in the Bible, then don't, don't address it. Yes. Okay, thank you. And then now, uh, Brother Wayne, let me see. You made a comment. Okay. Uh, do you have anything that you want to post regarding this sovereignty question before I go on to Jackson? Okay, okay. Brother Jackson, um, if... If, if the, the definition I gave you for sovereignty uh, for Calvinism is not really correct, uh, how would you define sovereignty or the concept of sovereignty? Uh, even though it's, the word's not in the Bible, do you think that God is sovereign in any particular way, Brother Jackson? Um, I, the way, it's kind of interesting. The way I've always thought of the sovereignty of God is just that he can do anything he wants and he can use bad things even for his good ultimate purpose. Yeah. Okay, thank you. sound? Sorry. You, um, I don't hear any particular sound except your voice and it's very clear. Strange. Okay. You hear the buzzing, but that, that's fine. The thing is, the thing though is, it's just... It, I've never understood the logic jump, this is the point I want to make, from saying God has the power to do whatever he wants and he knows the future to meaning he controls it like a puppet. I've never understood that, that leap of logic that people will make. Yeah. Well, that's, that, that's the, uh, the uh, differentiation that I was hoping you know, someone would make is that Calvinism says sovereignty means God actually controls everything at all time, and if that's the case, then man must be an innocent party. I mean, how could how could Brother Wayne be guilty of sin if God actually made him perform every sin? God would be the guilty party, and Brother Wayne would be innocent. He's just an innocent puppet. So that's how they see sovereignty. But Brother Jackson says, no, sovereignty is not that God exercises control at all times, but that simply that God has the ability and power to do what he wants. But he, one of the things he decided to do in his sovereignty is to give us free will. Now, let me ask, add to the question for Brother Bill, is that, okay, if this is the case, why in the world did God give us free will? Why is free will even important to God, Brother Bill? Why is it important to God? Yes. Well, the, the way I explain it in simple terms is, is I don't know who's, who's that is. I don't know this. Can you hear the buzzing, can you? I don't hear buzzing, but you and Jackson hear it. Is somebody, let me mute my microphone here. Let me see in case it's the problem. Right, can, you, can you hear me all right? Yeah, no buzzing now. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, basically, the, the way I like to, to see that I is think the, the buzzing, I, sorry real fast, Bill, I think the buzzing is the phone, Brother Luke. I think the phone is buzzing by your microphone. Sorry, Bill, continue. 
And Luke, you're yeah. muted, just in case. Yeah. In simple terms, you know, regard the free will. It's our, it's our greatest gift, I believe, that God has given us. And, and God being love in essence, you know, is it better that, you know, that man freely chooses to, to enter this love relationship with God or be forced to? You know, if you're forced to, you're a robot. There's no love. It, it, it's through being compelled, not through choice or, or desire. And I think that that is the crux of it, in, in, in that, that God is love, and he, he wants us to freely choose to embrace him in love. You know, hence he, he gives us that gift, you know, and we weren't created as robots, thankfully. All right, unmute. Unmute. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I had that muted while he was talking. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, you know, happy to hear what you said there because that's the that's the issue. Um, uh, if if my wife uh, was not freely given a, a chance to uh, be with me and be my wife and and have this love relationship, if I actually forced her to do it, let's say I abducted her and I tied her up and I forced myself on her. Uh, could we call that love, or would it be called something else? Rape. Yeah, it's rape. And God doesn't want, he doesn't rape us. He's not trying to force us into some loving relationship. That is not love at all. That's why God decided we, we have to have free will so that we can make a choice to have a relationship with him or not. Okay, let, let's move on now to Brother Austin, and that's the same question. What would you like to say about sovereignty, free will, and... Uh, and uh, what we've been discussing. Uh, I just wanted to make it known that I'm against uh, the first point of TULIP, the total in, uh, inability. I think that um, it's entitled where it's offered freely as a direct hard line to God through Jesus Christ for anybody that wants to take uh, part in it. Um, multiple yeah. verses, Revelation 22, 17, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, uh, John 4, 14, you know, it's always... It's even God sometimes almost trying to give it to him, like, just take it already, you know? It's almost like, why don't you just take it from me instead? I, I believe man likes to go through uh, man in a lot of cases to um, be justified by God when we go through Christ, one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ, to um, fulfill uh, the eternal promise of everlasting life. Okay. All right, thank you. Now, we're going to move on to the next question, and, and, and let me see, uh, okay... Oh, uh, Brother Wayne posted something. Let me let me read it. It says, uh, uh, "Oh, I, is this one of those contradiction terms?" Um, Brother Wayne posted this. Calvinist says God can give someone a false faith that looks like real faith to uh, to damn them further. And we ask, "Well, how do you know if you are saved?" The Calvinist says. The only way to know if I have saving faith is if I'm persevering in the faith. Uh, so your faith doesn't, doesn't save as the Bible says it does, but the evidence of obedience does. It's too bad a false faith gives the same evidence, which means you really can never know. All right, so that's wait, wait, wait. Uh, if you persevere in a false faith, does that damn you even further, further? Uh, for persevering in the first, in the, in the false faith, um, this this really is not really takes the good news out of out of the gospel pretty much. It's like it's not only because Jack uh, er, said earlier that it's only good news to some people. I'm not sure if you can call it good news to anyone in light of what Wayne just posted. Yes, exactly, exactly right. So uh, um, this idea of the, the tulip and the perseverance of the saints, and that's just another way of saying that faith is not enough. You must have works throughout your life. You must continue in the faith, continue in good works, and that's just a, another form of uh, work salvation. They do not believe in free grace. They do not believe in, in that uh, salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone. Okay, so now we're going to uh, go to the next qu question, and I'm going to go with Brother Jack Smack. Uh, and the question is, um, is Calvinism a cult, in your opinion? Oh, absolutely. I mean, they're following uh, a man. That's what a cult is. They follow their cult, they're the, the person who, who founded the religion. And so, yeah, they're a cult because they follow the teachings of John Calvin. They follow the teachings of, you know, Augustine. 
And of course it's a cult. And I would like to add one thing. Of course they have to work their way to heaven because their Christ is not good enough to save everybody. So therefore they have to like, you know, compensate for what he, what he was lacking. So just wanted to point that out. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, uh, your answer is you do classify Calvinism as a cult. Now I know a Calvinist, they're, they're going to be quite upset if, if we're calling them a, a cult. But, but uh, you know, I do agree with you. And uh, so let's go on now and ask uh, Brother Wayne. Did he make a comment here? Shows we have free choice, Brother Wayne. Okay, there's no comment here. Uh, God has free will and created us as we are created. Um, in His image, He created us with free will. Okay, uh, Wayne's refer comment about cult is a system of religious veneration and devotion directed towards a particular figure or object. So, uh, as Brother Jack Smack says, uh, I mean, isn't it obvious that when you call yourself a Calvinist, that you are um, putting a man named John Calvin up on a pedestal? Uh, you know, it's uh, almost like uh, idolatry, and and that's that's one of the signs of every cult is that they have a, an individual apart from Jesus Christ as the main figure in their belief system. Okay, so now let's go to uh, Brother Jackson. Uh, do you consider Calvinism a cult? You know, unquestionably so, and I consider it not just a cult, but kind of a group of cults, almost like a cult of, of several cults, because there's several churches adopting this philosophy and whatnot. And let me also point out something that I don't believe has been mentioned so far, is the very authoritarian nature of Calvinist churches and people in them. You know, I think I've told you before, I met this Calvinist on my college campus, and he, he was like, are you, a, he was asking me if I was with the atheist student group, and I said, oh no, I, I'm a Christian. And he said, oh, are you in a church? And I'm like, no, and I wasn't going to church at the time, so I just said no. And he said, oh, well, you need to be under church discipline. We need to make sure you're not being sexually immoral with women and whatnot and all this stuff and it was just it was just very cult like in my opinion because he was also saying I need to swear oaths to all these creeds and whatnot historically because that's what Christianity is end of quote okay alright um, it takes me a second to get back because I'm muting when you're talking there but uh, yeah okay so brother Jackson pointed out well, brother brother Jack Smack says that you, there's a, a particular figure this is a sign of a cult when you have a particular figure that is uh, venerated, John Calvin. And Brother Jackson says that another sign of a cult is that they take control, that you must be under their discipline, and it's a very rigid, rigorous, rigorous system of uh, being under their religious thumb. Okay? Brother Wayne made a post here. He says, I had a Calvinist who said Calvinism is the gospel. Yeah. Yeah, that's what they like to say, but as we go through this, you'll you'll find out that it's the furthest thing from the gospel. It's not, I mean, even the word gospel means good news, and there's no good news in Calvinism. Okay, well, we're going to move it on now to Brother Bill, and uh, my question is, Bill, uh, do you consider Calvinism a cult? Yeah, in, in, in simple terms, yeah. Yeah, it, it does venerate you know, a certain theologian, you know, I'd even say to the point where he's above God, you know, because the word is quite clear, and the, the doctrines and, and teachings of Calvinism, you know, go against the word of God, so they have to venerate this person above God. That's as simple as that. And to be honest, you know, it, it's a, it's a soul-destroying uh, cult of that. You know, as Brother Jackson just said, you know, that it, to me it's one step away from Catholicism. You know, although they don't, you know, mention words like penance and, you know, indulgence and stuff like that, you know, they do actually do that. You know, most Calvinists are lordship salvationists, and you know, you've got to be sorrowful and you've got to do spiritual pen, you know, penance every single day to prove you're elect. And you know, you venerate this this John Calvin, and the Romans venerate Mary. You know, I see a lot of similarities, you know, between you know Catholicism and Calvinism, to be honest. Okay, um, well, uh, one of the things that uh, I haven't heard mentioned yet, and I'm going to ask Bill to answer this, is that uh, 
usually in cults too there's a separate book that's uh, apart from the, the scriptures that they use and they elevate uh, and of course we know John Calvin wrote an enormous uh, book uh, book on his theology and do you find that uh, this is another uh, component of being in a cult is that they place the writing of the cult leader uh, as to equal or superior to the, the scriptures yeah yeah you get the same with, with the, the Mormons as well you know they, they see the, the, the Book of Mormon as more important than, than, than the Holy Scriptures you know we, we have a lot of Mormons you know where we live you know and, and their, their gospel is basically works 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 and, and you've got to adhere to the Mormon doctrines as opposed to you know biblical doctrines so we, we get a lot of that so yeah you know as soon as you you classify a new canon because you can call you know Calvin's works a new canon you know it's opened up a whole you know a new thing you know it, it, most of it isn't biblical or grounded properly on the word and you know this this bloke that said is, is revered you know so it is a, a separate canon i.e. then it'd be a, a be a cult it'd be a dangerous a dangerous place to be okay thank you brother Bill uh, okay, and, and finally, we're we're going to ask Brother Austin if would you classify Calvinism as a cult? Uh, yeah, I think I would, but mainly for the fact that it's united in error. Uh, you know, a group that unites in something that's wrong will always lead to um, more problems down the road. And if we're, uh, you know, in the view of Calvinism, we already have five points of heresy that's being uh, accepted as truth, and if I have 20 people that believe that, I can spread that to an enormous uh, uh, group of heirs. So yes, I believe it is cult united in uh, deception. Okay. All right. Thank you. Is there anything else you want to say before? Oh, let me make a, a read this little thing I put up on, on the cult idea. Is it, I, and if we just go to the dictionary and look up the word cult. I mean, you know, you know what, we don't use the dictionary necessarily as uh, the correct definition of all of our theological terms, but just what is a cult according to the dictionary? It says, a religion or religious sect generally considered to be extremist or false with its followers often living in an unconventional manner under the guidance of an authoritarian charismatic leader. Okay, there's more I'm going that's, to. That's Calvinism to a T right there. Yeah. So it's got all, everything we've been discussing about the authoritarianism, the charismatic leader, uh, the control. Uh, and uh, now the next part is uh, obsessive, especially faddish, devotion or veneration for a person, principle, or thing. Uh, anybody who wants to interject can, can comment on, on this as a, uh, you know, obsessive. Especially faddish devotion to or veneration of a person, principle, or thing. Brother Jack, Smack, why don't you comment on that? Well, I mean, these people want to, to defend John Calvin, even though he was a murderer and a tyrant and did lots of atrocious things. I mean, I just don't see why anyone would, would lift this mess up and try to, you know, try to exalt it for what it is. I just think it is. It's a cult and it's based on, you know, what just a very you know, select few people believe, and I don't even think they're consistent with their beliefs at all. I mean, they, most Calvinists will change what they believe. So, like I said, it's just a, it's just a big, you know, mass of confusion. So. Mhm. Mm yeah. So they've got uh, uh, this John Calvin. Uh, you know, he actually ran an entire city. He had absolute authoritarian control of or uh, Geneva. And, and not only just theological issues, but just you know, like uh, you know uh, how how a person should decorate their home or furniture or what they're eating or everything else. He he abs had absolute control over everybody's lives in that city, so it was definitely authoritarian. And even today, we see Calvinists uh, you know trying to uh, apply that kind of authoritarian rule over their uh, their uh, their group. Um, so uh, it is obsessive. Uh, the next part of the definition is um, uh, an exclusive group of persons sharing an esoteric, usually artistic or intellectual interest. Well, uh, I don't consider uh, Calvinism's Calvinists intellectuals. 
I think it's it's really quite stupid, and it's easy to show the stupidity of it. And yet, how does a Calvinist see themselves? Let's let's ask Jack, and then we'll move on to everybody else about that. Do you, do you find that when you Calvinism, do they generally have this air of of uh, intellectualism and, and think that they are, you know, they're the real thinkers, they're the intellectuals? Well. It, 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 yeah. Basically, it's, ba it's based on logic. It's based on their so-called intellectualism, because it's not based on scripture. And it's, I mean, you, you talk, and these the people, I mean, they, they're just, they're always mad, they're always angry, they're always defensive. And I've noticed another thing about Calvinism is that that's the only thing they'll preach or teach on is Calvinism. They won't teach on anything else. Now, that reeks of a false prophet right there. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 correct, and they're uh, they certainly are obsessed with it. I mean, every Calvinist I've ever met, they don't want to talk about any other th any other theological question. They always just want to interject Calvinism into everything. Everything. It's just they're obsessed with it. Um, okay, so uh, let me read this point. Uh, just brief brief point right here, and then I'm going to ask everybody to respond to it. It says. Um, Calvinism is a cult for many reasons. Cult-like behavior is always marked by an idolatrous attachment to the cult itself. Calvinists like to claim that all other theological systems are false. Calvinists have beliefs similar to the early Gnostics who believed the elect were those chosen ones who had the secret knowledge of God. They believe that anyone who does not accept Calvinism must be a non-elect and non-regenerate person. If you observe a Calvinist carefully, you will see that he has little regard for the true meaning of the Bible message. All biblical passages are run through the Calvinist mill. Any passage which seems to run contrary to his doctrine is reworked to fit into his system. Rather than conforming his beliefs to the Bible, the Calvinist tries to conform the Bible to his beliefs. Instead of trying to understand uh, what the Bible really says, he first asks uh, himself how any given passage might impact Calvinism. Then instead of honestly trying to understand the intended message of any given passage, he develops an inter interpretation that will suit Calvinism. Thus, all interpretations are custom fit to suit Calvinism. Uh, okay, I'm going to stop right there and just ask each one to to respond uh, to that. I'm going to I'm going to start with Brother Austin this time. I'm sorry, you there, brother. brother Austin. Yeah. What do you What do you what, What's my input on this? On um, on what topic? Well, yeah, what I just read, if you were listening to what I just read, do you have any reply to that? Is That's obviously, someone wrote that. It's They're certainly contra-Calvinist and then are, are describing Calvinists as uh, based on his observation of what how Calvinists are. Um, if you don't have something to say, well, I, we'll, we'll move on. Just, I think, intolerant to the truth. Yeah. Um, well, one of the main points there was that they don't go. They don't believe the scriptures. They reword the scriptures. All does not mean all. World does not mean world, and so on and so on. Every time there's a pr problem verse for them, they have to redefine all their terms. I'm going to go with Brother Bill Cuthbert right now and ask him to reply to that. Well, yeah, yeah, that, that's you know that's classic cultish behavior, isn't it? You know that they manipulate. The, the scriptures, you know, and they they, they 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 use their own branch of hermeneutics to 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 slot into their perverse jigsaw puzzle, you know, without just reading the Bible simply as it is, you know, it, it's not really not that complicated if you just read it as it is, and and as you said, they they will fit anything to to any shape or form of their theology to fit their corrupt. You know, puzzle that, that they can, and they will when they do. You know, and as soon as uh, you know, we, they're discovered doing this, and and the, the clear gospel is presented to them. You know, a correct puzzle. Then generally they get arrogant or rude. You know, and they talk on all manner of uh, wicked things. So there's the there's the real spirit behind Calvinism. You know, it's malicious, and it's cruel, and and it's perverse. Okay, 
Am I back on audio? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so um, the idea of them uh, taking verses, uh, you know, even John 3.16, you know, to them, uh, for God so loved the world, it doesn't mean world to them. They have to say the world it just means uh, all, all, all places all over the world you'll find elect people, so so it, not just in Israel. So that's how they have to twist things. Now, we, we all have a... Uh, a, a friend that's no longer with us now. I mean, he's not deceased, but uh, but he used to use this term, twisting the scriptures, and uh, uh, that's how I see Calvinism. Uh, that's what they do constantly: is that this, every scripture that refutes their doctrine, they have to twist it, and they have to try to make a square peg fit into a round hole because uh, the, uh, the scriptures clearly refute uh, Calvinism. Brother Austin, would you respond to that? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, one of the favorite things I've learned is actually from Brother Jack Smack on uh, John 3.16, and just the fact is that it refutes four false teachings, one of them being Calvinism. Uh, if I may read from uh, the scriptures, for God so loved the world, uh, already Calvinism is, is, is completed. It's, it's, it can't even comprehend the truth of that. Um, that he gave his only begotten son, you know, free grace, you can't even work for it, it's already given to you. Uh, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Uh, that's again entitled to um, everlasting life, you know, it's a, it's a done deal. And then, um, should not perish but have everlasting life, this refutes Arminianism, you know, once saved, always saved is truth. So we, with just one verse alone, you can um, destabilize anything that tries to go against it. And Calvinism, of course... Um, lies and says that God only loves certain people and only the elect, when in God's eyes uh, we see that he loves the entire world. Yeah, okay, so uh, in in that one verse, they change the definition of the word world. They don't mean, the world means all people, it means just all of the elect around the world, and they change the definition of the world whosoever. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whosoever doesn't mean any person who in the world that, that, that chooses to believe. It just means whosoever just means whosoever of the elect. So they, you can see what they have to do to try to support their, uh, their doctrine. And now Brother uh, Jackson, would you respond to this? Well, you know, it's, it's like... Um... <laughs> It, it what I what I think the the real problem is is it's elevating personal philosophy over what the Word of God teaches and whatnot like faith is a work and all that stuff and so you kind of what you do is you end up like reading the Bible through these theological glasses and 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 perform eisegesis rather than exegesis and I think that's how, how the only way. That somebody could say that John 3:16 doesn't mean that just anyone believing on Christ has everlasting life because Jesus died for everyone. It just seems so strange to me, but it, but it, but it, it makes sense in the sense that some people are so in love with their philosophies that they that they sort of view everything through it and whatnot. Okay, I'm uh, I'm going to ask you if you will define the terms you use because it's I think it might be a little more than uh, the audience understands and uh, explain eisegesis and exegesis and and why, how that applies to this conversation. Okay, gladly. Eisegesis is reading your opinion or theology into a text, whereas exegesis, like ex, like external, is reading theology out of the text. So if I if I say uh, that John 3:16 only means certain people, I'm arguing that's an eisegesis because it doesn't seem like it's anywhere in the text, but you're putting it in there. And whereas um, I would say saying that that means that universal atonement is is exegesis because that's just taking that out of what the verse says. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Well done. Thank you. And uh, I'm going to read the text that. Uh, our brother Wayne put up here. It says, uh, 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 "They are well versed in their doctrines, and if they have a point they cannot answer, they often become angry and rude. Uh, being called a, uh, I've been called a lot of names lately. Uh, well, I, I think that's uh, that's just a kind of a universal rule of someone who has a weak argument." 
a lot of times people they start losing uh, the debate and they know that they cannot defend based upon you know uh, the truth so they end up just resorting to name calling and rudeness and ins being insulting uh, so yeah we've all experienced that I think okay uh, okay uh, brother Jack Smack uh, what do you want to say about uh, what we've been discussing here in terms of eisegesis and exegesis and their, the way they change the definitions of all these words well, the Bible says to come to Christ like a little child. It doesn't say come like a theologian or a philosopher or somebody that possesses a lot of you know, erudition. It says come like a child. You, you, nobody has the right to sit there and, and say John 3.16 does not mean what it says. And they're guilty of doing that in many other places. Like in 1 Timothy 4.10, they, they try to say Savior does not really mean the eternal Savior, but it's like another type of Savior. It's, it's just baloney. I mean, the Bible says he is the Savior of all men, you know, especially of those that believe. I mean, anyone can understand that. Jesus Christ died for everybody, but it only, it only counts if you believe on it. It's that simple. Now, why would anyone want to try to, you know, render all this stuff so, you know, intellectually, you know, highbrowish and all that? That doesn't make any sense. So that, that's pretty much all I have on that. So, yeah. <laughs> so, well, what, uh, would you cite the verse you quoted there and uh, give us the, the, the address of that verse? Well, it's, it's 1 Timothy 4.10. It says, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach, because we trust in the living God. Now, if you're trusting in Calvinism, that's not the living God. It's the dead God. Because the living God is defined as the one who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Yeah, 1 Timothy 4.10 makes it very clear. Okay, all right. This is yeah. Okay, so for the listening audience, that's 1 Timothy 4.10. Uh, read it and consider it, please. Uh, okay, so now let's go back to the uh, outline here. Uh, now, uh, a lot of people will probably be surprised about uh, you know the origins of Calvinism. Uh, many people uh, think that, that John Calvin actually started Calvinism. I mean, it, it does bear his name, uh, but uh, Calvin was not the first Calvinist. <laughs> You know, uh, it go, really goes back to Augustine. Uh, I've got quite a bit of information about how uh, Augustine, uh, th he was from 354 to 430 A.D., and Calvin was, he was like uh, 1500 and something, wasn't he? Do you know the exact date of Calvin's life? Anyone? Uh, can you guys still hear me? Okay. Anybody know that? Well, okay. I think Calvinism was like 1550 or something. I'll, I'll, I'll look it up in a minute. Hey, but, uh, uh, brother, I got your date. Uh, what? John, yeah, I got your date. John Calvin, 1509 from uh, Picardy, France to uh, 1564, Geneva, Switzerland. Okay, so he was in the 16th century, from the early 1500s, and yet we can see that this philosophy of Calvinism started long before that with Augustine. And Augustine is also uh, guilty of many other uh, theological problems uh, that it was introduced into the church. But for now, we'll just talk about what he did introducing this Calvinism. But... Um, uh, uh, let me just read a point here and then I'll ask everybody to respond to this. Uh, uh, Augustine and Manichaeism. Manichaeism. I'm spelling it because I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly. It says M-A-N-I-C-H-A-E-I-S-M. Okay, it says, a dissertation was written to explore the potential Gnostic influence on Augustine. His, oh, his life, well, I guess 354, here it is, three. 354 to 430 is Augustine, his doctrine of predestination. So John Calvin, uh, from 1509 to 1564, admits that his theology was already developed by Augustine. So the question is, then, how did Augustine arrive at his view of predestination, which is quite the opposite of what was publicly taught within the church for the first 300 years of early church history? Uh, it was, should be noted that Augustine was himself a Gnostic Manichaean for nearly a decade before converting to Catholicism. Okay, we're going to start. Uh, we're going to start with uh, Jack Smack and work our way across here. 
based upon that, we learn that, that this doctrine of, of Calvinism was really uh, Augustine's um, uh, teaching, and he got it through, and he was a Gnostic, Manichaean, and then a Roman Catholic. So is, is this important for us to understand, Brother Jack Smack? Uh, it is, because, I mean, if you're not, if you're not saved, you're going to come up with anything. And I believe that's what happened here. He, he just came up with this garbage because it's, it's, it's Satan, you know, introduced it to him. I mean, it doesn't matter what the belief system is, it's going to be wrong because it's not of God. Mm -hmm. The uh, and he, converted, he became a Catholic after that. Go figure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now we know, we know that uh, you know Roman Catholicism believes in some basic truths that we agree with. They, they believe in the Trinity or Triunity of God, and they believe in the virgin birth, and, and they say they believe in the death and the cross for our sins. I'm not sure they really understand that, and the resurrection. So they believe in these basic things, and yet, um, uh, so we can't throw you know, the baby out with the bathwater and just say that everything in Roman Catholic Catholicism is wrong, and yet we know that there are some real serious problems. I think the Roman Catholic Catholicism is the largest cult in the world, since we're talking about cults. But uh, the uh, should we should we have some doubts and skepticism and worry when we see that the origins really are coming from a Roman Catholicism with Augustine? Brother Jack Smack, and then I'll move on. Well, and, and paganism as well. I mean, he was... I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that Augustine was guilty of. I mean, he just went from one system to the next, it seems, looks like. Yeah. Okay, let's ask Brother Jackson. Uh, is it important for us to, does it, should it influence at all uh, if we know that uh, a Roman Catholic was really behind the origins of this? Well, I mean, it doesn't disprove anything if we're going to be logical here. But here's the thing that's, that's interesting is what that debunks is something I heard James White say, which is that believing in free will is going back to Rome, going back to Roman Catholicism and everything. And it seems like despite some Roman Catholics having believed in free will, you can also just as easily trace uh, this stuff back to Roman Catholicism. So I think that it's important to know, to refute that argument, because a lot of times, and that's not just the only time I've heard Calvinists will act like you're being like a Roman Catholic if you don't agree with their theology. Yes. Actually. Okay, well, I mean, for me, I, I know that... Uh, uh, if I if I hear the terms Gnostic or Roman Catholic and other things, uh, sometimes that causes like uh, flashing red lights to go off, and it makes me worry. Wait a second, if this is somehow connected or or originated from Gnosticism and Roman Catholicism, that makes me worry about uh, you know the what I, I can I really can I really trust it. Uh, okay, let's ask Brother Bill Bill Cuthbert, Pan, the Panda Man Evangelist, to comment on this. I was actually, believe it or not, I was actually unaware that, that he was in a uh, Gnostic era until today, so I might not be the best person <laughs> to ask, but, you know, if, if that is true, then, then it is a danger, in it, if, you know, in that sense. <laughs> You know, as far as you know, as I knew, you know, in regard to Augustine, uh, if you learn right and see, he indicates that, that he, he believes in, in eternal security, which is fundamental. But obviously, he seems to err uh, quite a lot here, then, doesn't he? If, he? if he was, you know, involved in Gnosticism and, and, and that was brought into yeah. uh, the Roman theology. Brother Bill, I mean, uh, I, I, I suspect that you have the same kind of a concern that. Uh, that if uh, uh, some of these, ide these ideas have originated from a Roman Catholic, that to me is a big concern because I know Roman Catholicism has invented some of the worst uh, heresies in, in, in Christendom. And, and so if a Roman Catholicism and Gnosticism is the roots of this, then, uh, you know, uh, uh, shouldn't uh, shouldn't we really be uh, immediately have our uh, guard up and and uh, uh, you know, be very skeptical about it for that reason? 
well, yeah, yeah, this is it. This is why I'm glad it's been brought to my attention because I was unaware of it. And, you know, it's a danger. Even the Apostle John, you know, warned of, you know, the, the Gnostics, you know, creeping in in the early church. Yeah. So it is a danger. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to ask Brother Austin Bell to respond to that before we move on. Uh, yeah, if I get some clarification real fast. Who is an heir? Who's a, who's great an heir? Well, say it again. Uh, Brother Bill, he said that he didn't know until this day that somebody was an heir. I didn't know who we were, who we were talking I was, about. I was talking about Augustine. Oh, say not, for the is any from the Catholic Church? Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, was, I was unaware he was he was a, a Gnostic beforehand, you see, which is adds even more danger to the, to the element. Oh, yeah. Okay, so let's read a little bit more about Augustine and, uh, and the origins of this, since you can re reply some more on this. Um, it should be noted that Augustine was himself a Gnostic Manichaean for nearly a decade before converting to Catholicism. Generally, it is thought that Augustine developed his theology on predestination after debating Pelagius. That was 354 to... 420. Uh, but Cam Loon E, who is an investigative, like, uh, you know, investigating this, he suggests that it was developed from Augustine's debates with the Manichaeans. In terms of the inevitability of personal evil and divine cosmic ordering, uh, the Manichaeans represent the Persian branch of Gnosticism, and they taught both determinism and total depravity. However, their determinism was based upon dualistic mythology and also maintained a carnal outlook on bodily pleasure. Okay, let's, before we go on here, I just want you to comment on the ideas of determinism and total depravity. And we know, we know that the T in tulip is total depravity. And uh, determinism has to do with, uh, you know, the uh, sovereignty of God and his foreknowledge. So let me ask you to talk about determinism and total depravity, and are you surprised that this is going back to, like, the the fourth century? Uh, let's start off with Brother Jack Smack. Well, no, I'm not surprised because the devil's always been around. He's always deceiving people with, with this stuff. I mean, I'm not surprised that it went back further. I mean, but the bottom line is the Bible does not teach any of that. There's, there's total depravity. The Bible teaches that we're all sinners. But we're not so depraved that we can't respond, you know, to, to God through the drawing of the Holy Spirit. And we have verses that refute that, like John 5, 25, and Romans 1. There's lots of verses that talk about depraved people, you know, being able to respond to God. And, I mean, of course, they reject him. So, no, it doesn't surprise me that it came out a long time ago. I mean, it's probably out before that in, in the mind of, of Satan, you know, implemented, you know, through people and whatnot. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. And, and now I want Brother Jackson to to uh, talk about the the concept of determinism and total depravity. Tell us basically what that means, and and then also comment on the idea that it, it, hey, this did not start in the 16th century with John Calvin. It's it goes back to like the the early centuries, the very beginnings of the church. This false teaching came in, Brother Jackson. Yeah, that, that's right. Um, so for everyone's definition, total depravity, does, but by the Calvinist definition, is not what we is not simply the fact that man is so depraved he can't earn his way to heaven. Because the the Bible definitely teaches that. It's this idea that man cannot believe. You know, like 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 it'd be like if somebody is trapped at the bottom of a well, and you're and you're saying grab the rope and dangling in front of you and they're a dead body. Not that they just can't jump up and reach it, but they're a dead body at the, at the bottom of the well. That's how Calvinist views um, unregenerate people. They cannot believe. And then determinism, this is a really ancient philo philosophical debate, which is the idea that free will is just an illusion. There are atheists that are determinists as well. It's just that they don't believe God is determining things. They believe it's you know the atoms and the molecules in a formula, and that's all the reality really is. And I, I would have to say both of these philosophies really contradict what the Bible says. I don't believe in determinism or total depravity as defined by the Calvinist. And, you know, j just like Brother Jack said, 
you know, I really am not surprised either that this that, that it was this early because as soon as as soon as the church started and everything, you've got you've got Satan and his and his minions sitting there saying, "How can we mess things up? How can we cause division and and whatnot?" And this this seems like, hey, this is a great way to do so is incorporate these false philosophies and make it appear biblical. Okay. Uh, let me see. Where are we here? Uh, at the panel. Okay. Uh, uh, Brother Bill. Brother Bill, is, is there something? Is there something that you want to add uh, to what Jackson said to, uh, about the idea of determinism and uh, and uh, total depravity? Uh, and then also the question of: uh, Are you surprised that these things were brought in? so early in the church, not in the 16th century. I'm not surprised in in regard to, you know, Gnostic teachings and, you know, teachings, you know, almost on two different poles. You get, you get one pole which says we're totally depraved, you know, within the Gnostic community, and you get a, another pole which would say, you know, there's no such thing as depravity. You know, anything we do in the flesh means nothing. So I'm not surprised about that, but determinism, you know, I am surprised. Because, you know, we use, with determinism, you usually you know, the agnostics and the like, you know, but I suppose it was around then. I, I assumed that agnetism was, was a, a modern for, you know, not, you know, not being here or there. But obviously that's a surprise in, in regard to, to that. Okay. All right, uh, I'm going to read something that uh, Brother Wayne uh, just posted here. Uh, he says, the uh, question is, who wrote the best prayer concerning the life of sin? The answer is, St. Augustine wrote, quote, Lord, give me chastity and continence, but not now. <laughs> that is funny. Um, that's from his confessions. Uh, book called Confessions, I guess, uh, and it, 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 he, Brother Wayne goes on to write, uh, total depravity start with a statement that everyone would agree upon, which uh, is that man is sinful. There is no sane person on earth that would disagree with such a conclusion. So Calvinism takes this universal truth and uses it as a springboard into something that is not true, which makes it more palatable. Cults do this as well, and it is called the biblical hook. They put a little meat on the hook to catch you, a little truth to cover up the deception. Very interesting, Brother Wayne. Uh, okay, Brother Jack Smack, what do you think of uh, Wayne's comment there about uh, how Cal Calvinists bait us with this uh, little bit of truth? Well, you have to have a little bit of truth. I mean, otherwise, people will see right through it. I mean, it's going to be obvious that something's not true if it's just like blatantly, you know, false. So that's what they do. They use a tiny little bit of truth to snag you, and then once you're in, then they just—I mean, it's like a little leaven leaven the whole lump. Mm -hmm. All it takes it doesn't take a lot to get somebody, you know, trapped in a, in a lie. Okay. All right. So now let's move on to this uh, it's part four in the outline, and uh, the uh, subject is. Uh, uh, Calvinism destroys God's justice. Um, now, before we go into the uh, uh, the examples, I have quite a few examples, quotes from various Calvinists and even Augustine. But when I say that Calvinism destroys God's justice, uh, I'd like everybody just to respond. I, I don't even know if you're thinking in the same way I am on this, but let's start first. Uh, let's go to uh, 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 Brother Jackson. Brother Jackson, how does Calvinism destroy God's justice? Well, the the problem, and this is what we touched on earlier in the show and everything, is that Calvinists, if God causes everything, that makes him the only person who's really done ever, anything wrong ever. Because that means Satan was create what was was um sa Satan is controlled by by God so therefore everything Satan does God is doing, you know Adolf Hitler God just made him do all of that and um, 
all, all, all the rape and all the abortion and all the horrible things in the world and everything. It's just all God's doing. So it's interesting how God is the only sinner, and yet all these billions of people are going to be thrown into the lake of fire for all eternity, screaming, wishing they had never been born. And th so, in other words, God's the sinner, but the si but the per people he used bear the punishment for him. So I, I don't see how that could be just in, in any sane person's mind. Yeah. Well, very, very well said. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm going to, I don't want to add to that because I want, but I want to get uh, to Brother Bill now. Uh, could you elaborate further? Do you agree with Brother Jackson how he described this problem in, in Calvinism? Is God really just? Well, no, the, the God of Calvin isn't just at all. You know, the, he, you know he, throughout all the scriptures, Old and New Testament, you know, we are clearly given a free will to decide to love Christ or not to love him. And the God of Calvin does an injustice by, you know, taking away this freely given right, you know, and determines, you know, the majority of people to, to be cast into hell, to stop them, them desiring to, to, to come and know Christ, to freely choose and embrace what he's done for them. So in that sense, you know, the God of Calvin is not just at all in his cross. All right, yeah, to me, to me, uh, of, of all the you know the five points of Calvinism, even though every single point sickens me, really the thing that makes me most sick and most angry is this point here: is that God is not just. In Calvinism, God is the guilty party; man is the innocent party. You know, the, if, you've heard that saying, you know, and I guess a comedian probably came up with it, I think. And he said, the devil made me do it, you know, and, and uh, you know, thinking, well, I'm not guilty. The, the devil made me do it. Well, in Calvinism, uh, we have to say, God made me do it. Jeffrey Dahmer could say, God made me do it. I didn't do it. I'm just a puppet. God caused me to do that. He he took my hand and the knife and made me do these things. Uh, so it makes God into the guilty party. It makes God the only one that's actually evil, in Cal according to Calvinism, is God. And they, But then the ones that have to pay for all God's evil is man who's actually innocent. Okay, so let's ask Brother Austin to respond to that. Uh. I mean, it's completely uh, unbiblical to the highest degree, and it's it's a it's a deception that uh, a little you know, louder, a little louder, brother. Uh, can anybody can everybody hear me now? Right now? Yes. Yeah. What I was saying is this: uh, it is an injustice because it uh, defames uh, God's righteous standing and um, His love for mankind that He's entitled to uh, bring forth and establish a, a firm judgment. Who within righteousness he doeth judge and make war. Uh, the law was, uh, of course, not established for salvation, but established to keep order. And uh, looking along uh, these guidelines that in Calvinism, uh, that they make him and entitle him to be the one in control of everything is uh, completely moronic. And it's also evil and wicked to uh, even say that um, God, who is love and truth, will be the one behind uh, everything that's taking place. Okay. So the way I've always summed it up is that Calvinism attacks the character and nature of God. God's nature is and character is that he's love, he's mercy, he's justice. And yet none of these qualities are demonstrated in Calvinism. Uh, Brother Jack Smack, well, what do you have to say about this problem? Well, I would have to say that the God of Calvinism is the one causing people to do all this, these horrible things. But then again, the God of Calvinism is Satan. I mean, the Bible's clear in Galatians uh, 2.17, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. So the God of the Bible is not behind all this sin and all this this, this wickedness, but their God is. Their God is Satan. So in some ways they can justify how, how evil they are. Okay, so let me follow up a question for you then. Uh, uh, you say that their their God is Satan. Um, yep. We we know we know that their God is not the God of the Bible.
okay? Uh, yes. Uh, but then you say that they are their god is Satan. It certainly is to me. It, it's worse than Satan because in Calvinism, yeah. Satan is actually in an innocent party too because God made Satan do everything. So Satan and man is, are innocent. So uh, would you reply to that? Yeah, yeah there, there is no justice in, in, in Calvinism. For, I mean, they're just totally rendering God into a just total maniacal beast, basically. And I was just speaking in actuality, their God really is Satan. I'm not saying hypothetically. I've always said, now I, I've gotten in trouble with this with some people, where I say that um, there's a... a only, only two uh, religions. If I'm going to use the word, I hate to use the word religion, but you have Christianity, and you have Satanism. Yeah. Get, because every other belief system is really satanic, because Satan invents all of these other religions to make you not believe in Christ, but believe in Mormonism or Roman Catholicism or Calvinism. Uh, these are inventions of Satan. So uh, I would say that. Every religion is satanic. Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with Jesus Christ as your Savior God. Jack? I, I would disagree. I mean, every religion is satanic. I mean, if it's not God behind it, it's got to be Satan. Okay. Here, let, me, let me also say this. Calvinism. Okay. The, the God of Calvinism. Jackson, go ahead. Sure. I was just going to say the God of Calvinism... When when Jack says it is Satan, I agree, but it's like it's like in their mind, not in reality, of course. It's like an all powerful version of Satan is what it's like. Like I can imagine Satan you say he's worse than Satan, I can imagine Satan doing this if he had all the power and everything that God did. Yeah. Yeah, that it sounds exactly what Satan would do if he if he was able. And yet God in Cal in Calvinism, God is sovereign, he does have that power. And instead of exercising in a loving way, he does it in a satanic way. Good gosh. Okay, let's see what Brother Wayne has posted here. He put up quite a bit of stuff. He said, let me see, this is a call to Calvinists to turn from Tulip. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. O oh soul, are you tired of John Calvin? No peace in your soul, uh, night or day? There's life for a look at the Savior. Just trust him and do not delay. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And creeds of Calvin will fade away in the light of his glory and grace. Okay, that's uh, Calvinists. Are you listening? Uh, please heed those words. He's got more to say here too, but let me move on first and I'll come back to that. Okay, um, did I ask everybody about this uh, now, or am I we're ready to move on? Bill, did you get a chance to comment on this last point? Yeah, okay. Okay, so now let's. I'm going to read a few quotes here from famous Calvinists, and I, I just want everybody to respond to this, okay? Uh, these words were taken from a popular R.C. Sproul video, starkly revealed the dark underbelly of the Calvinist concept of justice. Quote, May the Lord curse you and abandon you. May the Lord keep you in darkness and give you only judgment without grace. May the Lord turn his back upon you and remove his peace from you forever, unquote. That's, that's what R.C. Sproul said. He, he said that prayer. Now, uh, let me ask uh, uh, Brother Bill first to respond to that. Uh, how could someone, how could you imagine anybody who calls himself a Christian praying such a prayer, Brother Bill? I, 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 can't, actually, I can't actually answer that. It's so anti-Christ, that's actually embarrassing that, that someone would claim to be a, you know, a son of God and say out of type like that. That's, that, that beggars belief. It goes against the gospel, the good news. It goes against the, you know, the love of God, and you know, and is a found in grace. It's, it's it's an anathema. Okay, yeah, that you know, it kind of reminds me of an experience I had when I was about ten years old. 
my father took me to a church in in Texas, and uh, uh, the 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 pastor uh, after his sermon he did an altar call, and no one came forward, and so he got very angry, and he said, "I know that people in here are lost, and you didn't come forward, so I pray that." The rest of today is the worst day of your life. Now that that kind of a uh, experience actually turned me away from Christianity for many many years. I had wanted nothing to do with Christianity. I thought if that's what Christianity is, I don't want to have anything to do with it. And it's this kind of a prayer from this Calvinist R.C. Sproul that's going to make people say, uh, no, no, I don't want any part of Christianity. I'll be an atheist instead, is what they think. Okay, Brother Austin, you want to respond to that? Yes, I apologize. Uh, there, uh, before I got off track, I did want to interject real fast to go back with um, something that Wayne said, and it also is something that ties in with um, Calvinism's doctrine of uh, the fifth point of the tulip uh, preser preservance of the saints. Uh, I did want to say that uh, when he was reading from... Hey, uh, Jax, I'm kind of getting some feedback from your mic. Thanks. Uh, that uh, Augustine, uh, he was talking about <clears throat> who uh, St. Augustine wrote, Lord, give me chastity and contents, but not now, uh, meaning he was taking pleasure and, you know, or he didn't want to give up his sin, of course, at that moment. And, uh, of course, in uh, Calvinism, they believe in... Uh, it's not just faith alone, and they even believe that faith is a gift and everything. But I just want to say that uh, uh, it's never entitled to have the free grace and eternal life of Jesus Christ where one must repent of their sins. Uh, repentance is simply a change of mind from uh, trusting yourself, or in this case, religion being Calvinism for salvation, and trusting the, uh, the free truth and the free absolute grace of Jesus Christ for uh, eternal life. And that, uh, in this case, uh, I, I believe that uh, mankind sees it uh, a lot in religion uh, that it it's it looks like I have to give up everything that I'm uh, I'm doing wrong even if I'm ashamed of it maybe I'm addicted to it or something else uh, but uh, in the words of Christ come on uh, come all unto me that labor and I will give you rest uh, the eternal life is there um, to be taken now with uh, a no question um, guarantee where you can have it and rest assured that you have it even though you uh, you still may stumble or have uh, some things to work out in your lifetime. Uh, eternal life is granted at the moment. Uh, faith is established in Jesus Christ for it. All right, thank you. Uh, Brother Jack Smack, do you want to respond to this uh, Calvinist prayer that I just read? Oh, I, don't, I don't really have to respond to it. I mean, R.C. Sproul is just not saved. I mean, I, I've read many articles about that. He's, he's a Calvinist. He doesn't have assurance of his salvation. He was on a, I mean, he was like this in despair one time, just didn't think he was saved because he wasn't good enough. Yeah, of course you're not good enough. That's why we're saved by grace. He's not He's not saved because he's he's in Calvinism. That's what Calvinism does. It gets you lost. So it's not, it's not, I'm, not, I'm not surprised that he would, would say something that, that, you know, that abominable, that atrocious. I mean, that's all I have to say about okay. it. That's uh, my uh, opinion. And maybe it's some kind of negative, but I okay. don't know. Well, of course you're negative. We're all negative because this is a negative uh, philosophy. It's uh, it's hateful. It's despicable. I'm going to uh, now. Brother Wayne posted a comment here. Another thing by R. C. Sproul Jr. Now, and Brother Jack, I want to ask you to respond to this since we're talking about the Sprouls. Uh, well, I wasn't sure there was. I didn't know there was R. C. Sproul Jr. I thought it was R. C. Sproul. I, yeah, there. I guess. Maybe, maybe I'm mixed up on who's who. Yeah. Well, they're. they're, they're yeah, they're both they're both saying the same kinds of things. But R. C. Sproul Jr. says God wills all things that come to pass. God desired for man to fall into sin. Oops, moved up. God desires for, for desired for man to fall into sin. I am not accusing God of sinning. I am suggesting that God created sin. Uh, this Calvinist. Uh, theologian unashamedly takes Calvinism to his logical conclusion that other Calvinists hold to the same view but don't speak so openly and plainly to their masses is a cause for concern. You see, here he's actually saying what we've been, 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 been claiming. We claim that, that 
uh, Calvinism teaches that God is the author of sin, and yet and now we have some of them actually come out publicly and say it. So, Brother Jack Smack, that's that's your oh, your, your R.C. Sproul Jr. Saying, how can you trust God if he's that sinful? I mean, what's the point? I mean, the Bible tells you to trust God over and over again. I mean, he wouldn't be, he wouldn't be very uh, he wouldn't be very trustworthy if he's out there, you know, like ludicrously, you know, creating all this mayhem and sin and evil. Yeah. What's well, the basis of trusting him if that's the way he but, is? Let me let me just interject this too. I thought sin, by definition, was something God hates and doesn't approve of. It, it seems like it's hard to call any bad thing a sin in this Calvinist system because it's all God's decree. No matter how awful it is, it's hard to say that even sin exists. Yeah, I've uh, I've actually seen some uh, Calvinist quotes where they actually acknowledge that uh, God hates sin. And then the next breath, they say God creates sin, and they say He creates it so that He can have more glory. But I, I, I'll get to that in a minute. I'm going to Jackson. I want you to respond to this J.I. Packer quote: "God orders and controls all things. Uh, uh, God orders and controls all things, human actions among them. He also holds every man responsible for the choices he makes and the courses of action he pursues. Man is a responsible moral agent, though he is also divinely controlled. Man is divinely controlled, though he is also a responsible moral agent. To our finite minds, of course, the thing is inexplicable. Jackson? Um, that, that's that's one of the most illogical statements I've ever heard. My my autistic mind's about to explode. Uh, it it doesn't make any sense. It's just it, it it's like that's like saying something is a square, but it's also a circle. Um, it's it, 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 it's it's I mean, it, it it's so it's so strange to me that people believe that and 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 think that because it, it it's on one hand I'm responsible. For for everything I do when I'm not the one doing it, that's almost like saying if somebody had like like was robbing was was, was shot, and they were trying their best even if they had a bulletproof vest and took all the necessary precautions to not get shot and everything, and if they still got shot anyway by a really powerful bullet, saying well they actually drew the bullet to them and everything like that. It just I I can't. It's hard for me to even think through. Well, that's why. He finishes by saying, to our finite minds, of course, the thing is inexplicable. And that's what Calvinists do. Uh, Brother Wayne goes on to post, notice again how Calvinists are quick to find refuge in, quote, unexplainable mysteries, unquote. Well, couldn't you argue, sorry, I was going to respond to that by saying, couldn't you argue for any contradictory philosophy on that grounds? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm a person, but I'm also a white unicorn. How are you a white unicorn? Well, your finite mind can't understand it. It seems like you could argue any illogical thing, in other words, with that justification that our finite minds can't understand it. Yeah, that's what the point here is that is made in this post that Wayne put up. It says, whenever they are pressed on explaining the logic of their conviction... Uh, uh, if, if one drops the premise that all human desire and choice is rooted in God's irresistible eternal decree, the mystery of how humans can be responsible for their actions disappears. Okay, so Brother Bill, uh, would you respond to these, uh, these posts? Uh, as, as a spiritual oxymoron, I, I just can't believe people can be that illogical and moronic to, to, to say something like that. I think, you know, <laughs> Robert Jackson has hit, hit the, the nail on the head, hasn't he? You know, you can't add any more to what he just said. You know, the only thing I can add is I'd, I'd add, you know, I want to be a green unicorn. Mm -hmm. Well, Brother Bill, Brother Bill, I mean, I, I, I don't understand how you can say that because because I mean, we know that the Calvinists are really the intellectuals among us. Well, yeah, obviously, <laughs> obviously, <laughs> they, uh, you know, do they not understand <laughs> basics? You know, I, I just, you know, the uh, Calvinists, the Calvinists are like the emperor who's not wearing any clothes to me. Yes. 
Yes, but th that's what Calvinists uh, think of themselves. They're arrogant, they're egotistical, they really think that they are the intellectuals and that we are somehow, we just don't get it. We're, our little minds can't understand the deep philosophies of Calvinism. Brother Jack Smack. The, the quote is, um, God orders and controls all things, human actions among them. He holds on, holds every man responsible for the choices he makes and the courses of action he pursues. Man is a responsible moral agent, though he is also divinely controlled. Man is divinely controlled, though he is also a responsible moral agent. Uh, to, to our finite minds, of course, the thing is inexplicable. <laughs> first one to interject that point and I think it's a very important point. Who is he? Who are any of these Calvinists to make these claims because these things are not in the Bible and yet they are, they are coming to these conclusions and then presenting it to us as, as a doctrine. Of what right do they have to come up with this? As, as Brother Jackson said, this is eisegesis. They're putting things into the scriptures instead of simply reading the scriptures and believing what it says. And they're not affixing a verse to it. Where's the verse? Where's the scripture? I mean, I don't even see a scripture in that. It's just a stupid, um, you know, un ungrounded quote. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Amen. Okay. Now we're going to go into a, a subject here where uh, if you've ever wondered uh, why would God do, do these things? Uh, you know, why would God um, uh, create all these people? And he randomly picks a few and regenerates them and gives them eternal life. And, and everybody else, uh, he creates them just with the intention of making them perform sins and then punishing them forever for, for the sins he made them do. Why would God do such a thing? I mean, it seems illogical and against the character of God to us. So here's, here's they're going to be talking a little bit about now, I mean, why God does such a thing. Okay, Douglas Wilson once put it in his blog, in a world without sin, Two of God's most glorious attributes, his justice and his mercy, would go undisplayed. So, uh, let me see if you can uh, relate what he just said there to, to what we've been, what I, uh, what he just said to what we've been saying. I'll start with Brother Jackson. I, it, it, it's literally hard for me to even follow what he's saying there exactly. He's because saying if, 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 if there was no sin, then God would not have an opportunity to show his mercy to us. But then it's not mercy if he's the one causing it then. That negates what mercy is. Yeah, yeah but, but they're, they're going to go on to say, they're going to go on to say, and, and numerous of these, these theologians are claiming that this is the way that God can actually demonstrate all of his glorious attributes uh, because he had to create sin. Otherwise, there would be uh, no way that he could show how merciful he is and how loving he is, at least to a few of the elect. Well, so, if, if, if creating sin and forcing people to sin is how he has to show his attributes, how does it follow that he's a fully good God? Because if we're talking about his attributes, you know, like the Muslims, I believe, I believe they think Allah like has an evil side of him as well. That would make sense in the Calvinist standpoint. But as Christians, we understand that God allows people to make free will decisions that are wrong. But the, thi the thing is, according to what you just said, he's causing them and he's showing all of his attributes. Wouldn't that mean some of his attributes are evil? Yeah. Well, we can clearly see it. Why can't a Calvinist see that it's evil? I'm going to uh, ask Brother Bill to respond to this Jonathan Edwards uh, statement, okay? Brother Bill, listen carefully. 
it is a pro this is Jonathan Edwards it is a proper and excellent thing for infinite glory to shine forth and for the same reason it is proper that the shining forth of God's glory should be complete that is that all parts of the glory should shine forth that every beauty should be proportionally effulgent that the beholder may have a proper notion of God it is not proper that one glory should be exceedingly manifested and another not at all thus it is necessary that God's awful majesty his authority and dreadful greatness justice and holiness should be manifested but this could not be unless sin and punishment had been decreed so that the shining forth of God's glory would be very per imperfect both because these parts of divine glory would not shine forth as the others do and also the glory of his goodness love and holiness would be faint without them nay they would scarcely shine forth at all if it were not right that God should decree and permit and punish sin there could be no manifestation of God's holiness in hatred of sin or in showing any preference in his providence of godliness before it there would be no manifestation of God's grace or true goodness if there was no sin to be pardoned no misery to be saved from how much happiness soever he bestowed his goodness would not be so much prized and admired so evil is necessary in order to the highest happiness of the creature and the completeness of that communication of God for which he made the world because the creature's happiness consists in the knowledge of God and the sense of his love and if the knowledge of him be imperfect the happiness of the creature must be proportionally imperfect okay there's a lot there brother Bill but if you got the gist of that what is your reaction to that well <laughs> Obviously, his God was a schizophrenic. I, I, I can't, I can't believe that these highfalutin, haughty people. That there's not a single ounce of scripture in that, you know, to say that God decrees sin. That that's 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 utter blasphemy, you know. I don't understand. Look, I can't logically understand it. You know how they would say that God decrees sin just so he can show how good he is it's just that's, that's a that's a no-brainer really yeah I mean, doesn't it make God some kind of a weak God that, that he needs to prove that to me that, that he can be merciful so he creates people uh, and and creates this scenario where he's going to be merciful to a few few so that those few can be really grateful and love him and say oh you're so merciful to me well, it's, it's not the scenario I could think of. If you can imagine, you know, getting one of your kids, send them to the shop to nick some bread for you, you know, and some sweets and some and some meat. Then when they get home, whack them with a stick. You know, it, it makes no sense. Why would God cause man to sin? And why would you cause your, you know, your your little ones to sin? It's totally contrary to to to, to God and 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 the Holy Writ. It's embarrassing that, that these people can even think like that. They must have some kind of, well, possession, I would say, or, or mental illness. Mm, yeah. Uh, I've got a lot more. Let me see if I'm, am I, are you hearing me? Did I muted? Oh, yeah. Let me see. I think I'm, am I muted? No. We hear okay. you. We hear you. Uh, okay. I've got a lot more quotes like that. But rather than reading them all, I think we get the point. But uh, I've got the same kind of a quote. Now, that was from Jonathan Edwards. He's a great hero of Calvinism. Of course, Augustine is really the founder of Calvinism. Uh, let me see, the 4th century versus the 16th century. So the 12th century earlier, Augustine really created all this. And he's making the same kind of a claim that the reason, I mean, if we're all wondering why would God do such a thing as Calvinism, well, they're telling us why now. God needs to show us how good he is, so he does all this horrible stuff just so that a few people can say, oh, you're so good to me. Uh, it's crazy, and uh, it's, it's part of Gnosticism and uh, Manichaeism, and it has nothing to do with Christianity. Uh, 
Okay, so I think uh, I, th I think we made the same the the same point could be made. I, and now, let me see. I've got uh, Augustine. Uh, the same kind of thing has been said by, uh, uh, of course, Calvin makes the same claim. Uh, uh, Sproul again, R.C. Sproul, R.C. Sproul Jr. Both. Let me see this. Uh, See, um, R.C. Sproul Jr. posted a Facebook status saying that since God is sovereign, even those things which are not as they ought to really be are just, and things ought to be as they ought to be. He went on to say that there are ultimately no bad things since God is completely sovereign. Okay, so Jack Smack, in other words. Uh, any tragedy, if you lost a loved one, uh, if, a, if a, a, a hurricane came in and destroyed you know, 3,000 people in a, in a town, and, and, and uh, that Calvinists say, we cannot say that's a bad thing. We all have to say, no, it's a good thing. God did it. Therefore, it's got to be good. Jack Smack. Well, we're just trying to get people solid in you know, these different areas of life. And... It's really kind of a cheap approach. I mean, if the person that undergoes this type of tragedy, they're not going to want to hear some philosophical well, It's not going to matter to them. You know, the bereavement and whatnot. I, like I said, what, what good, I mean, what, what, what are what, so, what these quotes that you can keep reading? How are they helping anybody? I mean, they're not getting the gospel to anybody. Not, to me, it's just a bunch of nondescript nonsense, a lot of these quotes. But yeah. you're right, it's not going to give anyone any, any comfort or solace if a person actually you know, existentially experiences this stuff. They're not going to care. They're not going to care about your quote. Yeah. Plus, it's yeah, that's a very trying to make sense out of that when they can't, when they, they just can't do it. Okay, that's very good discernment that you 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 saw that, and that there's a problem with this. Not only is it not the God of the Bible, but it's also how in the world is does any good come out of this? I said once before I was talking about Calvinism. I was trying not to talk about it. And I said, nothing good comes from talking about Calvinism. It's just, it's so horrible. Why? But now, of course, I'm realizing that we need to speak out against it. It's so evil. But could you imagine? Let's say that uh, I have a, uh, my best friend's little girl is 10 years old. She's abducted, uh, raped, you know, totally abused, then dismembered, and, uh, and, uh, and then... Uh, at the funeral, I, I go up to the father and I say, this is good. This is good because God, God willed it, God decreed it, therefore it's good. Okay, could you imagine saying such a thing? Well, I would say you need to go to the, to the Holy Spirit. I mean, you need to be committed. You're, you're crazy. And that's what Calvinism produces, insane, whacked out, psychopathic, crazed people. Yeah, and I would say that uh, you know, I was going to hold off on saying this. But my opinion is, when we understand how horrible and sickening and evil Calvinism is, what does that tell us about someone who embraces it? Any individual who embraces it, what does that say about that person? How and, in and the by the way, world, not just not just embraces it, loves it. Because a lot of people, it's not like, well, I think this might be true, unfortunately. These people say, I love Calvinism, and I love what they, they call this the doctrines of grace. And I don't understand how any of this is grace, but they, they, they say, I love Calvinism. I hear people say that a lot. I know. Well, my, my question, Brother Jackson, is that kind of a person. What is your conclusion about that kind of a person? Is that the kind of person that you want to, to you know, have fellowship with? And, 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 and I mean, you want to even associate with such a person, or do you think that maybe they should be committed into an asylum or put in prison because they embrace such evil? Well, the thing is, uh, let's put it this way: I knew a guy who was very, very nice, very cordial, very um, had had a lot of the same interests as me, and yet now I'm not comfortable hanging out with this guy, even though it never came into the conversation so much, just because I know he believes Calvinism and loves it, so therefore I don't trust him anymore. Even though he seems like a totally nice guy and everything, because to me, this is like padded wall level. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to ask Brother Bill Cuthbert to respond to this same point here. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a hard question. Because as you know, I, I was a Calvinist. And I was in error. And I think there are a lot of Calvinists that can be reached. Because I, I became one because I was never brought up to understand eternal security and... and, and True grace and all these sort of things. A very legalistic uh, church I was brought up years ago. So I was crying out for, for a God that actually cared. And unfortunately, I heard on the point where, you know, in the final point in Calvin's tulip, you know, perseverance of the saints. You know, and I, I, I spoke to some people who were Calvinists and they said, well, you know, if you're saved, Bill. God's going to make sure you persevere, so you you know you've got your eternal security there. So that's that's initially why I believe many people were duped into Calvinism. I was, and and I know people who are, and I even know people who you know I've spoke to, and thank God you know they've been brought out of that 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 dark theology, and and they are coming around to to realise that God is love, and he is he is a super you know abounding in his grace and mercy. And we need not worry, you know, that he, he eternally secures all these saints. He always has and always will, you know. Okay, so Brother Bill, when I made my statement that when we understand how evil and sickening Calvinism is, and then we meet someone who understands it and embraces it and loves it, what are we to think of that person? What kind of a person would do that? And then you turn around next, come right, you, right after I say that, you say, you were a Calvinist. Well, I would, was I, were you offended? Were you insulted no. when I said, no. when I, when I said no. such a thing? No, no, not at all. Because you have, you have degrees of, of Calvinism. You have, you have the, a lot of people who are in Calvinism who are there because they want security and have erred and they've never bumped into someone, you know, who's taught them proper biblical truth. But then you have the hardline Calvinists who, who are callous people. You know, they're elitists, that they're super spiritual, and they think they've got it all together. So, that, you know, Calvinism to me, I can define as a lot of people in error and good preaching, good teaching, and, and the love of God can break them out of that, which happened to me. And you get, you know, the real dark forces, the elitists in Calvinism, where it is borderline satanic, and, and they, they've got to have some real problems, to be honest. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I, I think that everybody here on the panel, and I hope everybody viewing, will join me in hallelujah that you got out of Calvinism. We and, and this tells us that, and I know there's other people who've got out of Calvinism. It is possible. Not every Calvinism is definitely stuck in it for the rest of their life. So there is hope that we can witness to them and they can see the light and get out of it as Brother Bill did. And, uh, and Brother Bill got out of Calvinism and he's gone on to be, if I can flatter you, Bill, one of my favorite saints on YouTube. I know what you're doing here is just magnificent with your street preaching and your videos, and yet you were a Calvinist. So I think we need to keep that in mind that uh, uh, even though, I, I, on one hand, I can say, what kind of a person could be a Calvinist? And, and But then I have to always keep in mind that, wait a second, uh, maybe they're not like reprobate and, and they're never, they can never uh, get out of it. You did. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty, you know, pretty okay. sound. I'm going to ask Brother Jackson to respond to this before we move on. I mean, Brother Austin. Yes, absolutely. I'll leave for Brother Bill to, um, to come out of such a such a mess. Louder, louder, Austin. Some somehow your your volume is not down. To get closer to the microphone or something. We it gets very faint. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, that's good. Very good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was just saying, hallelujah for uh, Brother Bill to come out of such madness. You know uh, what a what a mess Calvinism is. Oh, Brother Luke, you are muted. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to, um, yeah, we're all very happy, Brother Bill. We just praise praise the Lord that uh, uh, you, you got out of that. And 
Okay, let me see what we have left here. So I could go on and on pointing out other Calvinists, famous people, Piper. Uh, you know, so many people are following John Piper now. He said the same kind of a horrible things. I saw James White in a video actually say that he was asked a direct question. Uh, if some little girl is, is you know, raped and murdered, um, is, is that good? And, and did God make it happen? And he hem hawed around and he was pressured to answer the question. And he finally said, yes, God made it happen and it is good it's for his glory. So that's the kind of thinking that we find in Calvinism. Um, okay, now we're on to part five, um, biblical predestination. I, th I think we can get through this and then stop. And then I think next time we can finish up by discussing all the five points of uh, the tulip. Uh, so let's try to get through this part here now, and it is the question of biblical, biblical predestination. We've been talking about what um, predestination is and, and uh, you know sovereignty is with a, in a Calvinist perspective, uh, but let's look at what the Bible says about predestination. Uh, the Bible says that nobody was predestined for hell. It, hell wasn't even created for people. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. Uh, Matthew 25, 41, uh, Then shall they say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So um, the first thing uh, uh, we have to ask is, uh, how could people be predestined for hell when... Uh, uh, you know, hell wasn't even made originally for people. Is this an important? Is this a significant point or not? Let's ask Brother Jack Smack to respond to that first. Well, biblical predestination has really nothing to do with salvation. Otherwise, you would see passages that talk about people being predestined to go to hell. But you don't see that. So, yeah, people are not predestined to go to hell or heaven. It's in the in the sense, in, in the fatalistic sense. So, yeah, I mean. It's clearly made for the devil and his angels. It, it's not made for the, the non-elect, or the ones that would be included there in verse 41. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read another verse before we move on to somebody else, and I'm asking you, Brother Jack Smack, to, to comment on this also. It's Romans 8, 29 and 30. It says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, Verse 30 is, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Uh, now, uh, the thing that I'm emphasizing in this verse, as I read it, I said, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, to be conformed to the image of his son. I'm emphasizing that because I think it's a significant part of the verse. So, Brother Jack Smack, first, you get to go first on this verse. Well, I believe that the foreknowledge has a lot to do with, you know, it's proving that their, their system. I mean, they say he's predestined is based on nothing. And this is saying it's based on his foreknowledge. He knew who would, you know, would receive salvation by my faith. I mean, and, and yes, I mean, because we're not talking about salvation there. Because there are passages that talk about, you know, being, like I said, called to be conformed to his image. But, I mean, this just doesn't have to be, I don't, I don't know, there's just lots of different ways to interpret this. But I know many people that are not Calvinists think that a pretty good interpretation of this without their uh, flawed, you know, flawed thinking. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we are talking about the foreknowledge, and then uh, he was... Uh, and predestination, but but in the first part of this verse, uh, to me, I think this is significant, and I think this may be an area where a lot of people misunderstand. That's why I'm emphasizing it this way. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. So they were predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son. In other words, those people who uh, God knew who would be saved, God predestines all of us to be conformed. So every one of us, even the, the slow learners, the fast learners, the mature Christians, the carnal Christians, we are all 
predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son. We will all be glorified, and we will all have this glorified bodies, and we will all be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So let me ask uh, next Brother Jackson to comment on that, the way I emphasized it. Well, what I believe about predestination is sometimes I think it's talking about salvation, other times I think it's talking about service. I, I think that it can mean more than one thing depending on the context. Um, the, the idea that Calvinism has, though, that I truly disagree with very strongly is that God predestined people not based on faith, but really based on, they wouldn't say, that they, they really don't like this, this word, but I still think it fits. It's arbitrary, I, based on arbitrary means or, or who he wants. They would say, no, it's who, who, to, who, can, who to glorify him or whatever, which to me just begs the question. But that, that's what I would say about predestination. Okay. okay. All right, Brother Bill, we're talking about predestination and uh, foreknowledge. Well, yeah, I think you've got it pretty spot on. That's how I see that the verse and predestination and the like is God foreknew, you know, who who would freely choose, you know, to, to accept him as saviour, and who didn't. And the predestinate in that verse, we can see is to be predestinated to be conformed to the image of His Son, which will happen, you know, when we when we receive our you know our new bodies. Now that's how I read that verse. It's quite, quite clear to me. And like I said, I agree with the foreknowledge. It's because God can see out of time. You know, we are restricted to certain dimensions of time, whereas God isn't. So he can see, you know, from the beginning to the end, and he can see, you know, who has, you know, has accepted his Saviour and who hasn't. You know, so it's not negating, you know, man's free will to choose to, to, to love the Lord. Is just because God can see who is who has made those decisions, you know, in time and space. That's how I see it. Okay, thank you. The uh, so the if we were to define for no and predestined, uh, just define those words and then put those definitions into into this uh, verse here. I think this would make a lot of sense. Let me ask Brother Austin to attempt that. Just define the words foreknow and predestined. Brother Austin. Yes. Uh, are, are you saying you want me to do it from my own head or from dictionary? Uh, well, well, you know, if, if you have the dictionary immediately there, you can do it. I was just thinking just off the top of your head, if you have some kind of a, a form, a, a definition, whatever you want to do is fine. Uh, for foreknow and, I'm sorry, the other word? Predestined. Predestined. Yeah. Uh, both. I. Uh, I absolutely don't believe in uh, predestination, and uh, you know that's the idea. That the thought is is that um, this individual, regardless of who they are, or what they've done, are predestined by an infinite God to be selected for uh, salvation, um, being entitled uh, as the elect, where Christ only died for uh, certain people in their theory. And uh, I disagree with that completely by Jesus Christ dying for the sins of the world, um, past, present, and future for all uh, generations of mankind, every single man, woman, and child. And then for the, uh, the idea of uh, foreknowledge, uh, I disagree with that too because uh, mankind has always been offered uh, faith, even as a child, you know, come all uh, in and as a child, you should not receive the kingdom of heaven. So I, uh, the idea that um, you have to be a certain age or have a certain requirement of knowledge to, um, to be saved is also false, um, being the fact is that all one ever needs to know to be saved is that um, Jesus Christ did, in fact, uh, pay it all and that he offers it freely as a free gift uh, for all time. Okay, so when you're saying you don't believe in foreknowledge and you don't believe in predestination, I'm, I'm ho hoping that you're uh, saying you don't believe it in a Calvinistic sense. Uh, because uh, I think everybody else here will say we do believe in foreknowledge and predestination, but not the way the Calvinist defines it. Let me ask Brother uh, Jack Smack if you would define the word foreknow and, and the word predestined. Well, foreknowledge is just having a, a knowledge you know, beforehand. And predestined would be you're, you're actually determining something or you're ordaining something, but like I said, it's, it's not the way they interpret it. They try to say that everyone who is called will ultimately be glorified, according to verse 30, but they still forget that it's, it's 
based on what he foreknew. It's not based on something that he just, you know, decided and didn't give anyone any, any choice. So yes, I believe in both concepts, just not the way the Calvinists you know, try to yeah. interpret them. I mean, we have to believe in foreknowledge and predestination because the scripture says it. It says yeah. God foreknew. So we, how can we say we don't believe in, in, for, in to foreknowledge if, if the scripture says God foreknew? But as, as Brother Bill was saying, that to foreknow, and Brother Jack Smack says, to foreknow just means you know something beforehand. God knows the future. He looked into the future from eternity past, and he knew that um, all of us were going to put our faith in Jesus for our salvation. And because uh, he knows the future, and he, you can say, well, it's destiny. I've seen the future. It's destiny. Okay? Well, that's the correct, correct understanding. Yes. Um, so now let's go. Okay, so I think, uh, I think we pretty much... Um, covered uh, what we need to do for that. Uh, what we have left is TULIP. And TULIP, there's a lot to it. And I think that we, everybody just bring all of your TULIP uh, verses. Uh, all the verses that you want to use to uh, dispute and refute uh, any of these TULIP points, uh, have them ready for next time. I have some that I've selected, but I, I know there's many more. And um, so uh, let's close the show here because the two hours is almost up, and we certainly don't want to end any show uh, talk without telling the viewers, uh, you know, how they can uh, receive this gift of salvation. So um, uh, let me let me ask. Uh, well, whoever wants to volunteer, do a little altar call or or, or an invitation. Invite the viewing audience to uh, receive this salvation. Uh, who would like to do that? Uh, if I may say so, could we get Jack Smack to do it? It would be wonderful to have him uh, do it this time. Jack Smack, due to popular demand. Yeah, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. But I have something I want to, I want to say about Calvinism. Calvinism is this, in a nutshell. God only loves certain people. Jesus only died for certain people. And those he supposedly did die for, you got to work your way to heaven. And then you just end up in hell. <laughs> That's what Calvinism is. And that's what Calvinism is. Yeah. But yeah, the salvation is something that you have to work your way to heaven. Jesus Christ, in fact, died for everybody, everybody equally, because everybody is a sinner, and nobody can, can get around that. Uh, he died on the cross, he was buried, he rose again, and the, the fact that he rose again proves that if we put our faith in him, we will rise again as well, positionally right now, and which will heaven, because of what he did for us. Eternal life is a gift, it's free, it has to be given to us based on a choice, otherwise it's not a gift. And the Bible says to receive this gift, you set your faith alone in Christ alone. Jesus said in John 6, 47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. The moment you believe on Christ, you get everlasting life at that moment. You're saved forever, and you're eternally secure, and nothing can ever change that. Okay, all right. That's pretty much it. All right. Believe yeah. on Christ, and you're saved. Yep. Okay, so Brother Jack Smack just presented the gospel, the message of salvation for the audience. Uh, I hope everybody understood it, but I want to have a couple of follow-up questions for for Brother Jack Smack. Okay, okay. Let's say let's say, brother, that okay. I just heard your message, and I embrace it, and I believe it, and I say, but tonight, because I live in Las Vegas, and this is Sin City. Just tonight, I go out on the Las Vegas Strip, and I see all these temptations, and I go out and commit a big whopper of a sin tonight. How does that affect me? It, 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 it's, it'll affect uh, your life now. That you'll be that you'll be punished for that, but you will not you will not go to hell. You're, you're saved and secure forever. Salvation's in the past tense. It's done. It's not something that can, there's nothing that you can do to change it. Just like any other event, nothing can change the fact that it happened. You're saved and secure no matter what. Yeah, you'll get punished for going out and doing that. Of course, you know you reap what you sow, but you're still saved. Okay, so uh, if I believe your salvation message, and I get saved, and yet I go out and commit a big sin, uh, I'm not going to go to hell because of it, uh, uh, but I will somehow maybe suffer some kind of consequences for that kind of behavior. Oh, absolutely. If you, you probably end up in jail. You might end up uh, dead. Okay, yeah. uh, let me give you another example here. Let's say, now I've been saved for you know almost 30 years, and... Uh, uh, you know, I just went through this hospital time in the hospital with a, three surgeries, 
and I went through all kinds of horrible trials, and and uh, and it was very grueling, and uh, and I and I was praying, and I. Uh, I, I don't think I had my prayers answered. Uh, probably 100 people prayed for me, and I was getting very discouraged, and I was questioning God. So suppose that because of that trial, I got upset with God or stopped believing in God, and I said, you're not answering my prayers, God, and, and therefore, I don't believe you even exist. You don't even hear me. You don't even exist. I don't believe in you anymore. What would happen then, brother? I, uh, you'll be perhaps chastised, you'll, you're still saved, nothing can change that, and once you get to heaven, you'll know that it was all wrong. <laughs> yes. So I... You know, Calvinists would say you were never saved to begin with, well, I, yeah, and most Calvinists were never saved to begin with. Not yeah. talking about us, I'm talking about them. <clears throat> yeah, so a Calvinist would say that if I lost my faith or got into some sin, that that proves I never got saved in the beginning, but you're saying that if I commit a sin, I'm still saved, but you know, but, but sin does have some consequences on the, in, the, in our life. And if I even lost my faith or got angry with God, I, I still have my salvation, uh, even though I lost my faith. Uh, okay, I, I, obviously I, I agree with that, and, and I want to ask everyone on the panel to make final remarks here to the viewing audience, whatever you'd like to say, whether it's about Calvinism or whether about is about this invitation for salvation that we just uh, offered to the, the audience. I'm going to start with uh, uh, Brother Austin. Fi final remarks to the audience. Uh, just a great show. Uh, glad to be here. Wonderful fellowship with the Saints. Uh, just a nice guest appearance too. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for showing up and. Uh, uh, to refute Calvinism and its error, uh, I think only one verse does justice, and uh, it's my favorite, uh, John 3:16. Uh, For God so loved the world uh, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hallelujah and Amen. Okay, thank you, brother. Thank you for participating. And now we got brother Bill Cuthbert. Any final remarks to the audience about Calvinism or the invitation? Uh, get quickly. Uh, if, if you're a Calvinist, get out now. You know, God is good. God loves you, and He will secure you. You don't need to be an arrow or heresy to, to 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 know this. Just read the Bible for yourself. Just let you know, the, the Holy Ghost speak to you, and and just show the words and their true meanings to you. And I'd like to just finish off with with Titus 2:11. That's all right. And that is for the grace of God that bringeth salvation. Have appeared to all men, not some men, not a few men, not a select, you know, elite men. It has appeared to all men, and it's by grace alone. Just embrace this Christ, and the fact that he, you know, he died for your sins according to the scriptures, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. If you believe them facts and whom they are wrought, which is Jesus Christ, you will be saved forever. God Amen. is good. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. And uh, brother, brother Jackson, your final remarks. Well, just to add to one thing you said, Luke, when you were talking to Jack on the phone, you said if I commit a sin, I'm still saved. The wonderful thing about God's mercy is it's unlimited. You don't have to stop living in sin to be saved at all. Um, of course, you reap what you sow, and of course, you. Um, you should serve God. I'm not. I'm not s denying that whatsoever. But I'm just making it very, very clear because some people, it seems like they just can't get this through their head. You have to say it over and over and over again. Um, no matter what you do, how many times you do it, etc. All sin is paid for. Hallelujah. Yes. Okay, brother Jackson. Let me ask you. I've, you you've heard the saying that it's not a sin issue; it's a son issue. Could you elaborate on that? Well. Um, some 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 people mean some theological implications by that, but in other words, all sin is paid for by Jesus Christ. When you believe on Him, all your sins are paid for. All your sins are washed away. That that's all. That, what the issue is is that you don't. If you don't believe on the Son, um, you've you've rejected that payment for your sins. Okay. All right, brother. Um, I guess everybody uh, got their uh, Jack Smack. You want a final remark from you? Well, my 
hear a person who claims they're saved and they claim they're preaching grace, and then they say, "Well, I'm a Calvinist now. I better hear April Fool's after that." <laughs> yes. <Something's wrong. laughs> okay. Anyway. All right. Well, uh, I'm real happy. I think this was an excellent discussion. Uh, you are all some of my favorite saints, and I'm so glad that uh, we could do this. I'm really happy that you know I'm feeling well enough to do these hangouts again. And I'm really happy that the, the, the people who joined us today have, uh, offered some great uh, uh, great insights. So thank you very much. I'm going to close the show. And once I close the show, the live broadcast, it will still be running privately. So if anybody wants to continue talking privately, I'll keep it open, okay? So... Uh, I just tell the, the, the audience now, uh, th for, thank you panelists for participating. I love you all. And uh, to the audience, uh, bless you all. And, uh, and I pray that you will rest in the love and grace of our great Savior God. His name is Jesus Christ. <laughs>